And our first presenter is, is well known to so many people in this room is Dr. Philip Getson, who is a family practitioner. He, he, was, um, he is tr has treated thousands of people with CRPS over the years. He's one of our favorites. He's, and um, we're so happy to be here today with Dr. Getson. Good morning, New Jersey. So Jim said we should tell our story, so I'm going to tell you mine. Mid-1980s, I had a patient come into my office who had a constellation of symptoms. I had no idea what was wrong with her. So being the diligent family practitioner that I was, after having run a few tests, I sent her to a specialist, and then another one, and another one, and another one. And at thousands of dollars and multiple tests later, I was absolutely positively sure of what wasn't wrong with this woman, but still had no idea what was wrong with her. So I went to Jefferson Medical Library because we had no computers in the late 1980s. I had a roll of dimes for photocopy machines. Some of you may remember those devices. And I spent all day Saturday looking, found nothing, went back on Sunday, and about halfway through the day, I found a reference to causalgia. And I thought, wow, I've got this. And I spent the rest of the day throwing dimes into the photocopy machine, came back and said to the lady, I know exactly what's wrong with you. You have reflex sympathetic dystrophy. And she said, great. What are we going to do? And I said, I have no idea. <laughs> so I embarked on a course of understanding and learning for myself, going to lectures, reading books, and, and this. And in 1999, I got a phone call from the RSD Association, which was then in Haddon Heights, New Jersey. And it went something like this. Uh, Dr. Getson, my name is Mary. I'm from the uh, RSD Association. I said, yes. She said, we know we're having a big conference this weekend at Caesars in Atlantic City. I said, yes, I know. I'm really looking forward to it. As a matter of fact, my colleague and my friend, Dr. Schwartzman, is the keynote speaker. And there was a pause. And she said, well, there's a bit of a problem. And I said, well, what's the problem? She said, um, he can't make it. I said, well, that's not a really good thing. So I guess you're going to cancel it. And she said, no, we're not going to cancel it. And I said, well, who's going to be the keynote speaker? And she said, well, Dr. Schwartzman suggested you. And I went, <laughs> because I had never given an RSD lecture before. So what happened at that point was I got the books out, and I put together a program. And I thought, well, I'm replacing the world's foremost expert as the keynote speaker in this conference. So I have to be really good. I have to be really sharp. I have to get in there, and I have to hit it out of the park. I've got to bring my A game. So in October 1999, I stood up in front of a group of people about half the size of this at the third annual RSD Association conference. And it was quiet after I was introduced. And I opened my mouth, and I said, I don't know. They were the first three words of that lecture. And people looked at each other, and I see people muttering, if he doesn't know, and he's the keynote speaker, and what are we going to get out of this? And so life comes full cycle, and 16 years later, I'm here as a keynote speaker back in New Jersey, which, as most of you know, is where we practice, to tell you that 16 years later, while there's a lot that we still don't know, we've come a very long way. We're helping a lot of people have a quality of life. We're doing research. We're doing treatments that were unthought of 16 years ago. And we have internets, which we didn't have then, to be able to communicate with each other and to be able to learn and to research and to move forward. So my plan at this point is this morning to give you fundamentals. I'm not going to stand here and try and tell a patient with reflex sympathetic dystrophy, complex regional pain syndrome, what it feels like to have the disease. I'm not going to try and tell the caregivers and family and friends what it's like to live with somebody. I'm going to try and educate you as to the fundamentals this morning and some specifics this afternoon, which you probably don't know, and see if you can leave here smarter and more inquisitive. 
So the history of CRPS dates actually back to the 17th century uh, with King Charles IX, um, who had persistent pain and contracture of his arm following bloodletting. We've given up that procedure, by the way, for CRPS, um, and moved ahead to the Civil War um, when they first termed causalgia. In 1900, Sudek talked about complications of limbs and swelling, and the term reflex sympathetic dystrophy came to be in 1946. So for those of you um, who are told this must be a new disease, nobody ever heard of it, uh, et cetera, et cetera, it actually goes back, as you see, you know, four decades, four centuries, I'm sorry. Okay? And it has a lot of names. Every name that you see here is a name that has, through the course of those four centuries, been applied to this disease. Now, you, you, most of you are familiar with, with that term, too, from the bottom called reflex sympathetic dystrophy. And I'm certain that at some point today, I will drop back and use the term instead of complex regional pain syndrome. But these are some of the terms that are applied uh, to the disorder. And it is an a inflammatory neuropathic pain disorder. And, and I put number one as number one because it is severe pain that extends beyond the injured area and disproportionate to the inciting event. Now, what does that mean? Well, you know, you twist your ankle and maybe it's really a bad sprain, but how long does a sprained ankle take to get better? A couple of days, a week, maybe a week and a half if you're walking on it or trying to do too much. But if a month or two later, that ankle is still swollen, that ankle is still exquisitely painful, and that ankle is one that you can't walk on, there's a problem. And this is something that's poorly understood by the, the community and the medical community. So disproportionate to the inciting event means something that should heal that for whatever reason has not healed. Edema is swelling movement disorders, atrophy and dystrophy. Okay, there is no single cause of CRPS. Some of the causes include what you see up there. I see a lot of brachial plexus stretch injuries, people that reach up or reach out and the arm is yanked and pulled and the plexus which is in here gets stretched. And as a consequence of that stretch injury, the nerve, which is supposed to be like a rubber band and go back into its normal configuration, simply doesn't do that. It acts more like uh, saltwater taffy. It kind of gets stretched out and stays there. And nerves that get stretched out are not very happy and so they talk to you. And they talk to you by saying, I hurt. So a plexus stretch injury is probably what I've seen. Dr. Hardin, who is a member of the Scientific Advisory Committee of the RSD Association, says that following fractures or total knees, 11 to 18 percent will develop CRPS, which is the reason why people with chronic pain syndromes go to orthopedic surgeons who uh, will run in the other direction rather than do some surgery because they're afraid they're going to make a bad situation worse. We'll talk about that later, too. So it is, for me, imperative to control the underlying causes. You need to have the body as healthy as you can have it to get the CRPS under control. If the diabetes is out of control, if the thyroid is not working correctly, if there are medical problems, those need to be corrected before you can really hope to get the CRPS under some level of control. Adrenal defi deficiency is something that, that we're just starting to look at because um, chronic pain, chronic inflammation, chronic stress, uh, just out of curiosity, anybody in the room doesn't have any stress? Okay, just, okay. Chronic stress leads to adrenal burnout. And adrenal burnout is really a major contributor to chronic pain syndromes, inflammation, in this case, CRPS, okay? There are three stages of, of CRPS. Now, I will tell you that I put this in for informational purposes because people say to me, what stage am I? And so the, what I'm about to show you are the three stages of CRPS. I think it's a, 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 an overused and unimportant question because if you have CRPS, you have CRPS. And it really, there's a blurring of stages from stage one to stage two to stage three. You will see some of the things in stage one that, that go into stage two and go into stage three. But stage one, um, changes in skin temperature, faster growth of, of hair or nails, or slower growth, um, muscle spasm, joint pain, burning, 
uh, skin changes, swelling, back to disproportionate pain and sensitivity to weather or barometric pressure changes. Stage two allegedly lasts three to six months, and again, you see edema in there. Short-term memory loss seems to get better. We'll talk a little bit more this afternoon about sensitivity to light, sensitivity to sound, and sensitivity to vibration, which is what they are. Here they're saying slower hair growth and brittle nails. And stage three, uh, which is uh, irreversible, and again, I don't ever think it's irreversible because once you think something's irreversible, you've sort of given up. And, and I don't believe in giving up. So it, they talk about muscle wasting and more pain and accelerated changes. So it's kind of bad, worse, and worst, if you will. But those are the three stages of CRPS. And there are subtypes um, because the nomenclature, which we'll talk about in a little bit, changed in the late 1990s into the 21st century. And what used to be called reflex sympathetic dystrophy is now called CRPS type 1 without a nerve lesion and CRPS 2 which involves a nerve injury. And again, there tends to be a little bit of blurriness there as to whether or not the nerve has been injured. And you really have to say to yourself, well, what does that mean, a nerve lesion? Is it a nerve injury? Is it a permanent nerve uh, injury? And CRPS3, which, uh, CR, which is now not otherwise specified, came from the Budapest criteria, which you will see shortly, which meant that people sort of have symptoms that kind of look like CRPS, but we're really not willing to call it one or two, so we'll call it something. And, see, and, and so they call that CRPS NOS. Uh, quite frankly, I've never seen a case, but that's the, that's the nomenclature. And so the FDA has called this a rare disorder. Uh, it is anticipated to grow by at least 50,000 new cases annually. Now, understand that's 50,000 recognized cases. It's not 50,000 people walking around like my patient at the beginning of this where the doctor really had no idea what was wrong. That's 50,000 identified cases. And, and the numbers that the, that the uh, FDA has talked about, 250,000 to 2 million, I think are grossly understated. I think it is way more than that. Most common in ages 25 to 55, the youngest CRPS patient that I have ever treated was about eight. And the oldest one that I have ever treated was 88. And one wonders why somebody gets to 88 years old and is afflicted with this disorder. And the national statistics are three to five times more common in women than men. It's really, from what I've seen, and I've seen over 1,100 patients with this disease, it is really more closer to five to one. And so, signs and symptoms. Now, the key thing, obviously, is burning. Not everybody has burning. Not everybody has all of these. Not everybody has half of these. But these come from the RSD Association's website, and where it says abnormal swelling and abnormal hair or nail growth, as I said earlier, that may mean that the affected limb grows faster or slower. Skin color changes, usually red or blue, sweating. Interesting story, I had a lady come in, was sent to me by an insurance company, and they said to me, we want you to tell me what's wrong with the lady, and I had like four different stacks of papers, and I said, well, what are they? And they said, well, that's Dr. One, Dr. Two, Dr. Three, and Dr. Four. You know from the RSD Association that the statistics are that an average patient will see 4.3 doctors before somebody makes a diagnosis. So I was sitting in front of this lady as the .3, uh, trying to decide what was wrong with the lady. And I had taken and put all this, this stuff aside, and I was sitting on a stool. She was sitting on the table, and I had my little percussion hammer. I was going to tap her knee. And I saw this drop of water on her thigh. So I looked up because I figured, well, the ceiling was leaking, but it wasn't. And I looked back down, and there was another drop of water. And I thought maybe I missed what was going on up there at the ceiling. And I looked at her face, and she was sweating on exactly half of her body. Like Two-Face in Batman, if somebody had drawn a line right down the center of her, she was soaking wet, sweating on one side, and dry on the other side. So I took the stacks of paper, and I kind of piled them up and said, well, I don't need them. Um, but this is what happens. You get sweating in the affected areas. And she had one-sided disease, as most people start with. And, and it was really very easy to move on from there. Okay. In 1994, the, the International Association for the Study of Pain finally agreed on the diagnostic criteria and renamed this CRPS. But there was so much confusion as to what that actually meant. Was it type 1, type 2? And at that point in time, there really was no NOS that a group of individuals in 2003 met in Budapest, Hungary. 
Um, so when the criteria, when the, the Budapest committee got together, I don't know how they named the complex regional pain syndrome because it is by far not a regional disease. It is a disease that, that uh, initiates itself in an area, most often an arm or a leg. Um, and what happens at that juncture is that it spreads. And, and it spreads over time. Uh, there's actually only one article in the medical literature that talks about the spread of the disease. Uh, and it was written in 2001. And the discussion regarding the spread talks about the fact that 95% of the time it will spread horizontally or vertically, and 5% of the time it will spread on a diagonal. It absolutely positively spreads in about 90% of people. And I understand why someone would say regional is a misnomer because it's confusing. Uh, but it's what we have. Um, and, and I think that um, if, if you don't expound on it, if it's just CRPS and somebody doesn't call it complex regional pain syndrome, you probably get away with it because most people don't know what CRPS letters stand for anyhow. Um, it, it's a, an interesting um, thing, but there's not much we can do with it because that's what this criteria is and it's what has been accepted as the the current nomenclature, and until it's changed, we all understand differently. We can educate people to understand it differently, but that's, that's the reality of it. The, the criteria was um, to establish a uniformity in the nomenclature so that everybody was on the same page and looking at it from the same way. And this, as, as we said earlier, is what came to the, the uh, establishment of the NOS criteria. And they established these criteria, um, which again start with continuing pain disproportionate to the inciting event, and talk about subtypes, sensory vasomotor edema. And so you need to have one of the three symptoms and one sign in two or more. It's a very technically uh, complete but difficult to put into to simple terms uh, criteria. And it really is meant more for medical legal reasons so that we can say this person has this disorder basically because they meet this criteria. So let's talk about exacerbation. All of these things, and everybody in the room uh, who experiences this firsthand or secondhand knows about some of these things. We know about stress, we know about cold. It is actually the barometric pressure more than an individual temperature gradient that creates the problem. Um, Humidity, poor diet, we'll discuss that over lunchtime. Lyme disease, candida, etc. Spread of the disease was what I talked about before, and that's the article that was written in 2001. So how do you diagnose CRPS? Well, what you do, and what most people do, is they do x-rays, CAT scans, MRIs. I'm going to skip triple face bone scans for a minute, um, laboratory tests. Uh, somatosensory evoked potential testing, which is rarely done, quantitative sensory testing, which is a measurement of vibrational sense and the response of the body uh, to heat stimulus, and there's about 10 of them in the country, one over in Philadelphia. Uh, triple phase bone scans used to be done as the quote-unquote gold standard. The problem with triple phase bone scans is twofold. One, you're sticking a needle in somebody's arm and injecting a radioactive dye. So you have a person who has a chronic pain syndrome that may very well be in the arm, and now we're sticking a needle in that arm and injecting a dye, and putting them in front of an x-ray machine, which scans them, having had probably 3,000 x-rays in their life anyhow. The bigger problem is that statistically, only 10% of triple phase bone scans show the disease. So you're going through all of that for a diagnostic test that's about 10% accurate, and in my mind, Okay, not only is it bad for you, but somebody on the other side, somebody on the dark side, the insurance industry, is looking to say, see, the bone scan's normal, therefore you don't have CRPS. So unless I've got a 90 or 85 percent accuracy with the test, why am I going to do a test that's harmful and doesn't work? So I don't do them. Uh, discograms and myelograms and arthrograms are invasive tests where needles are in injected into the spine or a joint in, an, in advance of surgery. Thermography, which some of you know is infrared imaging, um, 
is in my mind the only diagnostic test that will show you this disease. It is a sensory uh, test of the sympathetic nervous system and a little bit later and this afternoon we'll look at some thermographic slides and I will show you why, okay? It is of great benefit because, okay, it looks at the blood vessels which are controlled by the sympathetic portion of the nervous system. And as it says right here, the hallmark of CRPS, excessive vasoconstriction or narrowing of the blood vessels that can cause cold hands and feet, okay? So we're looking at images of the sympathetic nerve system uh, from sympathetic origin, and it gives you a non-invasive, non-radioactive, no needles, tr better than 95% accuracy diagnostic test for this disorder, okay? Treatments, now, I, Mr. Butler will come following me and talk about physical therapy and some occupational therapy and maybe even some recreational therapy, and Dr. Boyajian will follow him and talk about injections and infusions and stimulators and intrathecal pumps and radiofrequency ablations, I put them up there so that you can see them. You will hear much more about that in the ensuing two hours, okay? Medications, there's a whole bunch of stuff. Um, I want to, to just take a minute and talk about pomidronate and neridronate. Pomidronate is a drug uh, that was released for calcium-related tumors uh, some years ago uh, and went generic and really didn't get um, a lot of use because there weren't a lot of calcium-related tumors. Uh, and has resurfaced as a, a potential drug for the treatment of chronic pain, failed back syndromes, and CRPS. Um, it has been, been used intravenously in a couple of research studies. It is, it, there, there is a pilot program from a pharmaceutical company that is going to use a, a, an offshoot of pomidronate to try that as a research study to see if it will work in its oral form. Okay, it's not pomidronate per se, um, but I know they're here today. Uh, to listen, and, and we have great hope of trying to find something that will work that doesn't involve intravenous medication. Neuridronate is the second generation of pomidronate. It is currently being studied worldwide. Uh, it was studied in Italy um, in a very small window of 21 patients where they found that it worked very well in CRPS type 1 patients who had had the disease six months or less. Um, some of these other things, mixilatine is an oral form of, of lidocaine. Uh, these are topical agents. Dextromethorphan is the DM in Robitussin DM. Um, amantadine used to be used for uh, flu and, and Parkinson's disease. IVIG is um, immune globulin that's done intravenously. And all of these are pretty common uh, anti-epileptics or gabapentin and everything that followed gabapentin. It has been my understanding and it's my belief that you treat problem, if you're going to use medication, if you're going to use medication, use muscle relaxants for muscle pain, use anti-inflammatories for, for inflammatory pain, as opposed to taking pain pills for everything. Because pain pills don't work for muscle spasm. Pain pills don't work for inflammation. A brief, um, Explanation of ketamine. Ketamine goes back, I'm sorry, ketamine goes back to 1963. They were looking for the ideal anesthetic. Um, and it has a fourfold affinity for the NMDA receptor of the brain, which is where the pain from this disease comes. So it seemed to be a really good choice when it was first introduced in the late 1990s. And, and it deals with serotonin and dopamine reuptake, and we'll talk about neurotransmitters a bit later. It is a useful anesthetic because it preserves sympathetic reflexes, so it's not further damaging the sympathetic nervous system, which is already damaged by the disease. It doesn't interfere with breathing, okay, and, and it helps prevent allodynia, um, excessive pain to an innocuous stimulus, hyperalgesia, excessive pain to something that should cause pain, but the pain gets worse. Uh, and so it is better for these types of pain than, than your classic post-operative type pain. Hence, they decided that this is a really good idea to use for um, CRPS, and we're, we're using this and have been since 1999. Ketamine goes through the P450 system, which is important because we're now looking at the genes and the genetic predisposition for processing medication. Um, and, and it is very, very safe because people with kidney or liver disease, you really don't have to worry about it. And the fact that it causes the blood-brain barrier makes it even safer. It's a very safe chemical 
when used in a proper fashion under proper controls. And initially, it was used, as Jim said earlier, the ER physicians are used to it because it's used in burn victims and removing staple. It's injected. Uh, it, it hangs around for a very short period of time, less than an hour intramuscularly, and it goes away. And so it was really used a lot for kids in emergency rooms where the kid had to have a burn change, a burn wound change. The child comes into the emergency room. He's not going to sit there and say, sure, go ahead and change this because it hurts. They would give them a shot of ketamine put the child in la-la land for a very short period of time, change the burn dressing, send them on the way, child wakes up, no pain, moves on his way, and no side effects. Chronic non-malignant pain, cancer pain, dental sedation, there's still a lot of oral surgeons using ketamine to do extractions in the office. Okay, you can give it intravenously, orally, topically, and intranasally. I have some concerns about intranasally because intranasal ketamine in patients that I have seen has been shown to create bladder problems. And the other problem with intranasal, although one would think it works better and faster, and it does work faster, it seems to, the tolerance seems to decrease very quickly, meaning that um, you start with a dose, and before too long, you need more, and before too long, you need more, and before too long, you need more, and before too long, you have bladder problems. I'm going to have to walk back to hear you. Oral? I, I found that with oral ketamine, it really doesn't work very well except as a bridge between intravenous treatments. People who get an intravenous treatment and have another one scheduled four, eight, 12 weeks down the line, and it just doesn't seem to hold, the oral seems to help it hold better because it maintains the body blood level of ketamine. But as an agent to use by itself in the absence of intravenous, not very well in my experience. So earlier I mentioned surgeons running in the opposite direction because they're afraid they're going to make this, this CRPS worse. Dr. Schwartzman and I uh, did an article that was published about the use of ketamine in surgery. And it said the major finding of this study of the ketamine use as an adjunct of anesthesia in refractory CRPS patients undergoing surgery was successful in reducing pain and blocking spread in severely affected longstanding patients. What does this mean? Well, when we wrote the paper, I had 22 patients that we studied, and the 22 patients went to the operating room for a variety of problems, anywhere from dental extractions to podiatry problems and everything in between. Most of them were knee and shoulder issues. And of the 22 people that we gave intraoperative ketamine to, zero extended the disease. And since the paper, which was uh, about three years ago, um, there's probably been another 22 that I have sent to the operating room, and zero have extended the disease. So I really don't have a problem sending people to an operating room to fix an anatomic problem as long as they are getting intravenous ketamine intraoperatively. And I do two things. I write must on the prescription. Patient must have a finite quantity of, of uh, whatever the number happens to be for that individual of intravenous ketamine during surgery. And the reason for the word must, which I found out in a kind of strange fashion, is medical legally, if the anesthesiologist does not give you ketamine with a must, they are liable for medical malpractice. Okay? We're not asking them to consider it. We're telling them this must happen. And I tell the patients, when you go into that operating room, if you're still awake, you say to the, the anesthesiologist, is there ketamine going to be in this surgery today? If they say no, get up and leave. I had one person do that, actually. She actually got off the operating room table and left. Okay. Because why take chances? I talk about psychological counseling because families need to be involved. You are living with somebody who has this disorder. You don't understand necessarily what they're going through. Hopefully by the end of the day you understand a little bit better. But I think if you're going to do counseling, you, ha you have to do it jointly or maybe however big the family is. Everybody needs to be included in that. I have a lot of people come in and say, what about antidepressants? And my answer is that antidepressants to me are great for short-term use, but in a long-term disease, unless the person with the disorder is not functioning. You know, I walk into the room, how are you doing? Today? I can't talk to you. Well, that, you know, that doesn't work, okay? So antidepressants sort of have a place, but I try not to use them because you're not going to make somebody less depressed until you make them better. The other thing that I will share with you today is that I learned the hard way 
the Cymbalta, and I'm mentioning this be because I'm sure there are people in this room on Cymbalta, is a brutal drug to discontinue. I have easier times getting people off of narcotics than I do getting them off of Cymbalta. And, and we were never told of that, okay? And when you try to take people off Cymbalta, they have rebound and they just have shakes and they get worse, and it is a terrible drug to get people off of, in my experience. Off-label, you well, Cymbalta, for example, in its use, when they say Cymbalta works for pain, Cymbalta works for pain in such a very low level that it's, for me, it's kind of like trying to shoot an elephant with a rabbit gun. I mean, it's just not enough. So I try not to use antidepressants unless somebody's non-functional. So what other treatments do we have available to us? Well, we have diet and lifestyle alteration. We'll talk some more about that at lunch. And we'll talk about gluten-free and organic. Stop smoking. Home exercises, I'll leave that to Mr. Butler. Reiki, which is energy therapy, manipulation and massage when you can. Acupuncture, vitamins, B12. Um, there's a product that has B12 and intrinsic factor in it together, which seems to work very well for people that have chronic uh, CRPS pain and hormonal and neurotransmitter balancing, okay? And, and so it's not a novel concept to try and treat people without pills. Neurotransmitters are chemical messengers um, that facilitate uh, communication between neurons, which affect every cell and every organ. There are more neurotransmitters in your stomach than there are in your brain, hence why we need to eat properly. Um, the neurotransmitters are out of balance, the communication is altered, and you get physical, mental, and emotional clinical symptoms. Some of you in the room participated in a study that we started, unfortunately, almost a year ago about neurotransmitters. We were looking to find out whether or not the neurotransmitters, there was a pattern in CRPS patients. Just this week, I spoke to the company, and they, there, in fact, is a pattern. And so after all this time that has elapsed, for which I'm apologetic, there is going to be a, a, a treatment protocol that we're going to look at to see if it works using neurotransmitters, amino acids, for the treatment of CRPS pain based upon that study, okay? And here are some of the major neurotransmitters. Some of the names I'm sure are familiar to you. Uh, we know that, that from this, Week's conversation that epinephrine and norepinephrine and one that's not on here called taurine are affected. Hormones, um, again, those of you who are in my office know that once a year we look at the hormones, male and female. We recognize that the hormones have an absolute effect on pain. We recognize that, that um, estrogen balance is essential because hormones being out of range and out of whack and out of proportion contribute to um, significant pain. Now, I don't know if we're gonna get an audio to what is here. I don't think so, okay? Because when we changed it over, we lost the audio um, from the other computer. But those of you who remember Network, um, the movie, know that what happened at this point in time was that he said, my life is worth something. I want you to get mad. I want each and every one of you to stand up, go to the window, open up the window, and yell at the top of your lungs, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. That's what this clip was. And I want to take two minutes and I want to introduce you uh, to Megan, who has been a patient of mine for some years and who comes down from um, New York a couple of times a year to see me. And I will tell you a couple of things in advance of this testing. Megan um, has CRPS, and it, whatever treatment there has ever been, she has done without any success whatsoever. When I saw her last, which was, I guess, about a month ago, um, you tell them how much weight you've lost and, and whatever, but I was so impressed with what happened with her, I thought it would be good for you to hear this. Um, I lost uh, 100, 150 pounds 
in the uh, thank you. Um, last year I was in the hospital um, I was in a very very dark place as I'm sure all of you have been um, and my mom and I were talking and I wasn't happy with who I was inside or out. Um, we all go through depression, we all go through anxiety. I'm sure we've all thought about what it would be like if we weren't here anymore. But then my mom and I talked and we knew I had to change something. Um, I've had it for 24 years, going on 25. Um, I got it when I was seven and they had no idea what it was. And I have had everything under the stars done to me. Um, I feel like a guinea pig, but if, it, if we find something that's gonna work, um, I am going to keep trying and trying. So I decided that I was in such a dark place that I needed, and I, I was the only one that could do it, to dig myself out of that dark place and to start eating healthier, to start um, as, as much as I could exercise um, and it took a long time, but I am mad as hell, and I'm not going to take it anymore. <laughs> and not that I'm in any less pain, um, but I know that, what? Um, I know that I'm important and I have a lot of loved ones and family and friends that need me in their lives and I know that I need to stick around and not let life pass me by sitting in bed crying and being depressed about what I have. Um, I don't let RSD um, define me anymore. Um, I have RSD, but I'm not a victim of it. And I think once you, and I was at my lowest, I think once you hit rock bottom, it really slaps you in the face and it's like, wow, you know, I've got to do something and you're the only one who can do it. And it's really easy for me to say this because I've been where all of you have been. And going through everything my family and I have gone through, it has not been easy, but I won't give up. And I know most of you won't give up. And you just gotta get mad enough and want your life back. So it's it's been just a struggle and it's still a struggle, but with Dr. Getson's help, Dr. Schwartzman, Dr. Aradias, and my family, I feel like I have a new lease on life and the way I think about it. So thank you very much. So I will leave you with the Optimist Creed. And for those of you who have not seen it, and for those of you perhaps who cannot see it in the back, I'm going to read this to you. It says, to be so strong that nothing can disturb your peace of mind, to talk health, happiness, and prosperity to every person you meet, to make all of your friends feel that there is something worthwhile in them, to look at the sunny side of everything and make your optimism come true, to think only of the best, to work only for the best, and to expect only the best. To be just as enthusiastic about the success of others as you are about your own. To forget the mistakes of the past and press on to greater achievements in the future.
to wear a cheerful expression at all times and give a smile to every living creature you meet, to give so much time to improving yourself that you have no time to criticize others, to be too large for worry, too noble for anger, too strong for fear, and too happy to permit the presence of trouble, to think well of yourself and proclaim this fact to the world, not in a loud word, but in great deeds, to live in the faith that the whole world is on your side so long as you are true to the best that is in you. Words to live by. Thank you very much.